But let me just give you a brief, um, brief uh, definition or brief what these, what these believe. And my conclusion is going to be, if the social justice movement gives false answers, and I'm going to give you their false answers to these big questions, then it is false teaching that is incompatible with Christianity, a Christian worldview. And what I'm going to take it one step further, if there's enough false teaching that is organized, that they have sacred books, they have leaders that are recognized leaders in this space, if they have that, then it's not just false teaching, it's a cult. And if it's a cult, we know what to do with cults, okay? We also know what to do with false teaching, which we'll look at about halfway, uh, less than halfway through our, our time together. So, all right, so I'm going to give you the social justice definition, and then we're going to look at one, one passage of Scripture. There are multiple passages of Scripture, but one passage of Scripture uh, to answer what God says is ultimately real, okay? What is ultimately real? Social justice says the human mind defines what is ultimately real. Why does the human mind define what's ultimately real? Because the human mind is the authority in life. When, remember the postmodern chart from last week? Postmodern say science is no longer our ultimate authority. Our human minds are our ultimate authority. So whatever I think in my mind, that is what is ultimately real, okay? So if that's the case, there are 7.9 billion people on the earth. There are 7.9 realities, billion realities on the earth. Talk about confusing, okay? If we, if we follow this <laughs> logically, you can't have 7.9 realities, billion realities on the earth. It's not going to happen, okay? What does God's Word say about what is ultimately real? Someone look for me or quote Genesis, who can quote Genesis 1-1? In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. What does John 1-1 say? In beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Who defines reality? Why does he get to define reality? Because he's the creator. It is that simple. And he is at the very center of everything. He is at the very center of the universe. He measures the universe by the palm of his hand. That's how big God is. We measure by light years. Okay? The span of his hand is how big God measures. And it could be that the whole universe is in his living room, so to speak. And we can't even get out far enough away from the universe to, to see how big it is. We're guessing at how big the universe is. It's not hard for God. God is so much bigger than us. He tells us what is real. And he made us dependent creatures, dependent on him. Okay? If we get that wrong, he defines reality. Why does he get to define reality? Because he's the creator. He spoke and things came into existence, Genesis 1. All right, what is ultimately real? The human mind is not, doesn't define what is ultimately real, okay, because the human mind can change. All right, so who are we then? If what is real, some say that's the human mind, and we say God and his word defines is our greatest reality. Uh, he's eternal. God's word is eternal. It's forever settled in heaven. Who are we then? We are image bearers of our God. Someone look up for me, Genesis 127. Who would read that? Someone on this side, Genesis 127. All right, Pastor Ty. And then on this side, Romans 8, 29. All right, Jeff. Who are we? Let me give you the ideal, ideological social justice answer. We are creatures whose identity is wholly socially determined. So we are only, our identity is only how what uh, people say around us. We are products of our race, sex, and gender identity. Okay? That's who we are according to the social justice movement right now. All right. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. All right. So everybody on the planet is made in the image of God. 
That is why we fight for the unborn. That's why we fight for justice no matter what uh, color someone's skin is. That's why we fight for anything that is blatantly unjust in our, in our world that attacks humans, that is hurting people. We're going to be most adamant about image bearers of God, more so than the environment, more so than the whales and the trees, because whales and trees are not made in the image of God. So we are most adamant as with a Christian worldview when God's image is attacked in humanity. So God tells us we're made in his image, that's who we are, and then Romans 8:29. Okay, so Romans 8.29 says that God saves us so that we would be conformed to the image of his son. So everyone on the planet is an image bearer. We have a bad image of God, like we don't love, we're not patient, we're not kind, we envy, we boast. We do opposite of what 1 Corinthians 13 is telling us, and we don't look anything like our God until he rescues us. When we were dead in trespasses and sins, he makes us alive. Now we're alive to God. Now we can respond to his love in ways that dead people can't respond. Because we are alive to God, we can now be an imitator of Jesus Christ. The very intent that God made us in the first place, and Adam and Eve destroyed the image or seriously marred the image of God, but everybody still is made in the image of God. Everybody on the earth loves justice and hates injustice. Why? Because we are image bearers of God. So you can see how God's word defines who we are and that we're, our, our um, identity is wholly socially determined. No, it is theologically determined. So God tells us who we are and why we're here. Okay, third question. What is our biggest problem? All right, here is one of their an- answers. Okay, what is our fundamental problem as human beings? Oppression. White, heteronormative, males. That means we are not homosexual males, okay? White, heteronormative males have established and maintain hegemonic. Okay, if you didn't know what that word means, it is a leadership or dominance, power. They maintain these power structures to oppress and subjugate women, people of color, and sexual minorities, LGBTQ+, and others. That's the fundamental problem of human beings is oppression. Well, let's see what God's Word says. God's Word says rejection and rebellion against our Creator, marring the image, and rejection when God does send Christ, rejection of our Savior. So rebellion against God's design, and we don't want to be image bearers of God, okay? So God sends His Son to save the world, and then we reject Him. Let's see what Rome, or John 3, 18 to 21 says. Someone read that for us. John 3, Will, 18 to 21. If we have tried to love God and tried to love others in the power of the Spirit, and the world says we're, we're haters, we can't wait for the true judgment when God says, well done, thou good and faithful servant. I don't care if the whole, whole world called you bigoted, haters of hateful people, you actually loved, like 1 Corinthians 13, okay? Jesus is telling Nicodemus in John 13, after John 3, 16, God so loved the world, He is the only begotten Son. 17, God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world, that the world through Him might be saved. But what's the problem with humanity? The problem with humanity is sin. When the Savior comes, they don't want Him. Why don't they want Him? Because they want their darkness. What causes us to be, has nothing to do with skin color, it has everything to do with our hearts. Why are we in darkness? Because of our sin. 
Our rebellion against the Creator, you can see it in Cain on, did not want God's ways. You can see it in Lamech, seven generations from Adam and Eve, when he has two wives, he's already distorted what God's design was for marriage, and he's killed a man for wounding him. You can see it didn't take very long for man to get really far from God. You can see it right after the flood, it took about 100 years for man to build the Tower of Babel in rebellion against God. Okay, so we are quickly, we, we easily and quickly go away from God because we're rebels against our Creator, and when Christ comes to rescue us, we reject Him. And uh, for the most part, the world rejecting our Savior. And that is all a summary of sin. Sin is our biggest problem. But it's not, that's not what the social justice movement says. Fourth question. What is the solution to our problem? Remember, their fundamental problem is oppression and power structures that are oppressing people. Here is the, uh, the solution. Revolution. Oppressed victims and all their allies must unite to unmask, deconstruct, and overthrow these oppressive power structures, systems, and institutions. So we have to revolt, and everyone who is part of that victim class who have been oppressed, and all those who realize they were oppressors and they didn't even realize they were oppressors, they're going to join those who have been oppressed, and now we're going to tear down everything that has been... um, all these power structures. Okay, that's their solution. Revolution. All right, let's see what God's solution is. 2 Corinthians 5.21. Who will read that for us? John? Stephanie. If our real problem is sin and not oppression, then what are we going to do with our sin? And Christ is the only solution to our sin. He who knew no sin became sin for us. So there is this power and there is oppression, but it's not oppression by white people or any other power people. It is oppression by sin. Sin oppresses all of us. Sin causes us to be dead in trespasses and sin. Sin is the problem, not skin. And so, if sin is the problem, then our solution is clear. Our Creator became man. Christ became sin for us so that we would have God's righteousness. Next question. How can we be saved? If you get the problem wrong, you get the solution wrong, then you're going to get the salvation wrong too. So, remember, oppression, revolution. Here's how the social justice movement, at least right now, or a year ago, said that we can be saved. Victims are morally innocent and do not require salvation. Oppressors can never be fully pardoned, but partial salvation is available if they confess their complicity in oppression and support the revolution. All right, so this salvation, if you are white and our culture would tell you you are white, then you are never fully pardoned, okay? But you can be partially pardoned. And if you are a minority group, that you're not white, then you are innocent, and you don't need to do anything other than keep the revolution going and wait for oppressors to join you. But that's not, they got the problem wrong, they got the solution wrong, and salvation is also, let's hear what Romans 10, 9 says. There are many other verses we could put in here, but we don't have time to to read more than one. Go ahead, Claire. You will be saved. Saved from what? Saved from oppression? No. Saved from sin. Who needs to be saved? all sinners. doesn't have anything to do with the color of your skin, anything to do with your social status, anything to do with all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We saw that last week. So all need to be saved. This is redefining and changing good theology to be 
it sounds good on the surface, but when you compare it to Scripture and you compare it with these questions, this is a false gospel. This is a false teaching, false theology, and it is rampant in our society, and churches are allowing this kind of thinking and teaching to come right in and, and encourage Christians to think this way. So we, last week we looked at what our primary, primary moral duty was, and we looked at it, love God, love your neighbor. We talked about it in, some, or in church as well, so we're going to keep going. Who has ultimate authority? I'll give you this, and I'll tell you what uh, social justice movements is. This thing is not... Are you guys doing these, or am I doing this? Okay. When I do it, you do it too, <laughs> and then it's twice. Okay. Who has ultimate authority? John 5, 22 to 27. Someone want to read that for us? Six verses. We could go back to Genesis 1 and John 1 and say who has ultimate authority, the creator. But there's more, obviously, there's more than just one or two passages. One that captures it is John 5, when Jesus was questioned about authority. Someone that hasn't read? All right, Lisa. All right, who has the authority to execute judgment? Christ. He's not delegating that to anybody. And when he was on earth, people that rejected the Son thought they were following God. And he's speaking to Jewish people here. He's saying, if you rejected the Son, you've rejected the Father too. We're a team. You can't have one and, and the other. The Father as creator and Jesus as Lord and judge are the ultimate authority. And because they're an ultimate authority, they will judge. Let me see what, uh, um, what they answer as who, is the, who has ultimate authority. Victims are the final authority. The claims of victims based on their subjective lived experience must be believed without question. So if you are a uh, white heteronormative male you are the opposite of a victim, and you have no authority in this space. Anytime we speak, we don't have all the authority because, um, because I'm not a victim. And uh, victims are those of the other, all, all the people who were oppressed. And is there a future final judgment? This is what the social justice movement says now. No. There is no God who will return to punish the wicked and reward the upright. Rather, injustice must be rooted out here and now by those with the power to do so. And revolution is all about changing powers, right? So if we don't have power, we're going to empower people so they can get power. Why do they need power? Because they need to um, bring out, um, they need to root out all the, the injustices that are in the world now. All right, but that's different from God's timeless truth. Is there a final judgment? John 5, 28 to 29 says this, Do not marvel at this, for an hour is coming when all who are in the tombs will hear His voice. Who are in the tombs? How many people in the tombs are going to hear Jesus' voice? All. There's not one person that's going to stay in the tomb, no matter when they died, of all of humanity, all of time. They're going to hear his voice, and they're going to come out. They have to. He has authority over them. And those who have done good to the resurrection of life, and those who have done evil to the resurrection of judgment. How do we know good and evil? Well, we know what the problem is, we know what the solution is, and we know what the salvation is. But if you reject the problem, reject the solution, and reject the salvation, there is no chance for you to be good. 
in the eyes of God. And there was no chance for the Pharisees and all of their righteousness to be right with God with, by rejecting Jesus Christ as their Savior. And everybody today has got to have more righteousness than the Pharisees in order to have eternal life. Jesus would say that in, the, in Matthew 5. So there is a final judgment, and you can read about the great white throne in Revelation 20, and all the dead, small and great, are there. You can't say that there is no future final judgment, and we are not the ultimate authority, and our primary moral duty is not to stand in solidarity with those who have been oppressed and join the revolution with them. And uh, so this uh, is, is a dangerous, um, seemingly good on the outside surface. We're all social people, and we all love justice. But if we demand justice now on a fallen planet, and there's a verse in, I think, Second Timothy that says there God will perform all the justice, and all those who haven't received justice will get their justice in the end. It's not our job to do God's job now when He promises that He is the final authority and He's got all the information needed to give out perfect justice in the future. Some of you may be saying, so we don't have to help anybody who's oppressed today? No, that's not what I said. I said, we don't have to root out all the injustices today because that's not your job. If you think it is your job, you're going to be running around forever and not even scratching the surface of what your real job is supposed to be, which is what? What's the Great Commission? Make disciples of all creatures. And when they're made disciples, you teach them to observe everything that Jesus has written. That's our job. And you can see how this is a false gospel giving a false great commission and join our revolution and we say, we can't. Our God and Savior told us to do something different. He's got a different plan, a different strategy, different power, different way of looking at the world. He's got, everything is different about our worldview and they're coming at it from a different, different worldviews and they're all, uh, many are jumping on this, this, this wagon of the social justice movement and is very influential. It's very um, much infiltrating all, all of our higher education, all of the big companies, even now lower education. They're gonna start teaching little children that there's oppressors and oppressed and try to brainwash kids who think this way. All right, any questions on this? That's a lot to think about, Hutch. Well said. Those students of history can see, right? Cycles of revolution. All right, any other questions, comments? So I wonder what time Sunday school started. I heard the bell, I didn't look at the clock. 10.25, okay. All right, so what do we do with false teaching? If we can agree that this is false teaching, what do we do with it? And God's word also doesn't, isn't silent about what to do with false teaching. Let's go to Romans 1, 24. Romans 1.24 tells us that God starts giving people up to the lust of their hearts, to impurity, to dishonoring of their bodies among themselves because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie. Did you hear in the two definitions of what is man's problem, what's the solution, what's salvation? You hear that God's truth is completely, and the existence of God is completely written out. We do not need a God in the social justice movement. And the Christian worldview is like, there's no ultimate reality without him. He, you can't exist without him. Okay, so very different way of looking at the world. 
Why is God giving them up? Because they are impure, do whatever you want to do. Verse 25, they exchanged the truth of God for a lie, worshiped and served the creature rather than the Creator, who is blessed forever. Only the crea Creator is blessed forever. What are we going to be doing forever and ever? You can read Revelation, you'll see it multiple times throughout the book. You're going to fall down and worship the Creator, and He will reign forever and ever. That's what we're going to be doing, okay? A worldview that does not have a, a sovereign God, a loving sovereign God, is a worldview that needs to be replaced. And a sovereign, loving God is the only true reality. And when you reject Him, He starts allowing you to create whatever world you want to create. And it's not going to be better than what God has already designed. It's going to be worse. 2 Timothy 1, let's look at there. Uh, 2 Timothy 3, I'm sorry. 2 Timothy 3. So what happens in a culture when more and more people are rejecting God as creator and rejecting Jesus as savior? When more and more the culture is doing this and they're looking at problems through a different uh, lens and not looking at the right problem and not coming up with the right solutions, what do we do in a culture that's like that? It's keep, it keeps getting more and more wicked. Why? Because they're suppressing the truth and we tell them about God and they don't want to hear it. They just want to do their own thing. And God starts letting people go. And as he lets more and more people go, they're going to start giving us laws that's going to make Christianity illegal. That's going to make you have to join this revolution or you are now evil. And good is called evil, and evil is called good. It's coming. It's already starting to come. All right? But we're not surprised by this. The Roman culture was, was really bad, too. There's a lot of other cultures and around the world. Why do people want to get out of Afghanistan so bad? Because of the Taliban. Taliban's culture and their worldview is not biblical worldview. And why do people want to flock to this country? They're waiting at our borders to get in here because our country is built at least partially on, it was influenced by a Christian worldview. And now the Christians who gave us, and you can see it on statues around that are more than 100 years old, uh, but they won't put any verses on statues in, uh, anywhere around now because God and Christianity and the Bible is the problem instead of, well, no, there's a lot that... Uh, you're rewriting history to tell us uh, that our country's not great because we were, um, have a lot of Christian principles. Well, 2 Timothy 3 tells us what happens when the last days come. Verse 1, but understand this, that in the last days there will come times of difficulty. And he's writing to Timothy, and this is Paul's last letter before he dies. 4, verse 2, for people will be lovers of self, lovers of money, proud, arrogant, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, heartless, unappeasable, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not loving good, treacherous, reckless, swollen with conceit, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having the appearance of godliness, but denying its power. Avoid such people. This was written 2,000 years ago, and it sounds like Paul lived in a major city in the United States. What do we do with false teaching? We avoid it. We don't embrace it. We don't we can learn what not to do from it, but there's no way that this should have uh, ve very little influence in our, in our lives. I would encourage you, don't join the revolution. Don't read exclusively oh, um, some books that I'll, I'll warn you about that I read, and you want to read them, that's fine to understand the other side, but don't, uh, don't be influenced by that, um, that worldview. 
Don't get sucked into believing lies to evaluate everyone based on their skin or their wealth or wherever they were born or whatever status that people want to judge people by. But almost every institution and stuff, whenever and when you get your driver's license, I think, all these questionnaires, evaluations, when you go to the doctor, what is your race? Ah, I put other. I don't, I'm not white. I don't identify as white. The world might look at me as white, but I'm like, that's not helpful at all. Okay? You can disagree with me. That's fine. But we'll talk about, we'll talk about race um, in a little bit and maybe next week. Immerse yourself in God's word in order to start thinking and acting like God. You will not think like God unless you have God's truth in your heart, in your mind, in your brain. You memorize, you meditate on it day and night. I mentioned last week in, in uh, church and Sunday school, Jeremiah 9, 23 and 24. If you want to start thinking like God, this is where I would start. If you don't have Jeremiah 9, 23 and 24 memorized, put that on your, that's your homework this week. I'm not going to send you an email. That's your homework this week. All right, memorize Jeremiah 9, 23 and 24, and start thinking about it. Okay, I want to hear what, how those two verses influence your thinking this week. Okay, they've influenced my thinking quite a bit. I want them to influence my thinking more. Uh, but we can't be influenced by God's word unless we're thinking about it and we're meditating on it. Okay, and so... Memorizing is the first step of meditation. We memorize so that we can meditate on God's Word day and night. We don't have to put our glasses on. We don't have to turn a light on. We don't have to turn our phone on. We know God's Word in our, in our minds so that we can think about what it means, okay? And I watch the news, and I'm reading the Word. How do I put these two things together? What do I believe is true? How should I respond to the news? How should I respond to the social media post? How should I? There's so much information out there. We need to not be ignorant of God's word, his truth. All right, so start here. Uh, memorize Jeremiah 9, 23, 24. I'm going to pause for questions. All I'm going to do is probably wet your whistle for next week for what I'm going to talk about that's probably more controversial than what I've said up to this point. All right, any questions? Think of a question, email me, text me. Write it on a slip, put it on my desk, put it on the podium. Give it to a friend to give to me. That's okay. I'd like to hear your thoughts. All right. I'm going to tell you about uh, these two guys, as much as I know right now. And we're going to start uh, next week with um, critical race theory. If we took race out of there, you watched, you watched, uh, how many of you did the homework? Okay, you watched, was it critical theory? Is critical theory biblical, right? That was the topic. I watched that twice. Um, did, was that helpful? Any questions or comments based on that video? I almost showed it, but I didn't want to take five minutes of class. If you haven't done the homework from last week, watch that video. It's a cartoon. It's five minutes. It's good. All right, Lisa? Okay, how it's different than Christianity. Good. All right, any other questions or comments? John. The guy on the left there is from Boston University. That's Ibram X. Kendi. He's the one, if we wanted him to speak here instead of me, you could pay him twenty to $40,000 to teach us about how to be an anti-racist. But you can pay me a lot less, and I won't tell you the same thing. I read his book, or I listened to it. It took me about 10 hours, and it was, it was fascinating, honestly. He grew up in New York City. Um, not a great area that he grew up in. Um, but he identified, he was an anti-racist from a, a little boy. He hated, hated racism. And um, you can hear that. And he read, he read the book as I was listening to it. So you can hear his, his passion. Um, and I admire his humility, honestly, as a, as a scholar. And 
social sciences. He's at Boston University, and he is uh, part of a, a group, I believe, that are working toward um, identifying anything that's, um, anything that's racist in our culture and trying to root it out. So he's probably one of the leaders of the revolution, so to speak, of the social justice movement when it comes to race, critical race theory, and um, how to be an anti-racist. But he says something that I'm going to mention uh, probably in closing, that race is just a social construct. There's not really anything as race. And when he said that, I thought I was going to die. I'm like, oh, are you serious? The person who wants to be an anti-racist is telling us that race is not really a thing. Now think about that. If race isn't really a thing, it's just made up, okay? How do we know race is just made up? Because we're all descended from Noah. One race, we all one blood, we can intermarry, we're all just a human race, that's it. So if race is just a human construct, then racism really isn't a thing either. <gasps> what? Is that logical or is that illogical? If race is just made up, and I'll show you a quote from the Smithsonian on the left side here, they have a National Museum of M-A-A-H-C. Uh, National Museum of African American History and Culture. They have that. I'm assuming it's in um, Washington, D.C., SIS Smithsonian Institute. I took this right off of their website in the beginning of the article that was race and racial identity. Although race has no genetic or scientific basis. If race doesn't have any genetic or scientific basis, why are we even talking about it? Let me encourage you to think about ending racism by not even talking about it. Because it doesn't really exist. You say, but it does exist. Okay, but it's not a real thing. And if the Smithsonian says it has no genetic or scientific basis, so where does it have a basis in? It only has a basis in the human mind, which is the authority now. Okay, so go back here and I'll, I'll close with the guy on the left read his book, guy on the right, Jamar Tisby, is a believer, and he is woke. He is one of the leaders in Christianity of that we need to embrace critical race theory. And I will tell you what's on his website next week. But he's written this book, Color of Compromise, and helpful history in there of the awful things that happened to uh, African American people in 100, 150 years ago, and the lynchings and everything that's happened. Um, doesn't hold back in, the, in that, but he is strongly influenced, I would say, by Kendi and that his solutions look almost identical to Kendi's because he's getting the problem wrong, he's getting the salvation wrong, and his solutions look identical to the world's solutions, and I'd say, that's a book that's very dangerous, and I'll say it's dangerous because it's written by a Christian, and a Christian who embraced the gospel, and that we would uh, admire him and treat him as a Christian brother, not someone like Kendi who is secular and probably evolutionary and, and many other things we disagree with him about. Um, but there are a lot of Christians that are writing books about how to be woke, how to be a woke church. Um, and so there are <laughs> a lot of resources out there. Uh, but read with this discernment in mind. Do they have God's word as the authority? Do they have Christ as the center? Do they get man as a sin problem and not a skin problem? And if not, then they're probably strongly influenced by the world. And the world's very influential. Um, and it, it makes way more money if he is for wokeness instead of against it. Because the guys who are selling the books that are not woke, that are, that are one that I'll show you next week, it's probably not going to be as popular. It's just not. The money's not there. Um, uh, Anti-racism is a huge business, and it's, I think it's a cult, and so we'll talk about that next week. But if you've got questions, write those down. Uh, you may have questions, and we'll, we'll spend next week uh, here. Um, any final questions? Confuse you more than I helped you, and send you off to coffee. All right, let's pray. Father, thank you for the truth that you give us in Romans and uh, Timothy, um, that we can see our culture, we can see the horrors of walking away from you. 
And the trying to do life without a Savior is dangerous and deadly. And I pray that you would help us to be about exposing false teaching and that we would guard our hearts and our minds and keep our hearts and our minds in Christ. Help us to know your word so well that when there's a counterfeit, uh, we can identify that because we know your truth so well. Help us to be men and women of the book this week and give us grace as we work on Jeremiah 9, 23 and 24. Thank you for being a God who practices steadfast love and righteousness and justice in the earth because you delight in those things. Help us to delight in them as well. In Christ's name, amen.